Hi everyone, welcome to sessions. Last week we said that our next session would be about tasks that seem unimportant. We're going to discuss today the stroke, the liver, patient, heparin therapy, brain surgery, and urine and feces, the lessons we can learn from them. Let's start with this patient, Sally. She's in the ICU. She's had a stroke. It's obvious that she's got some very important things going on. She's being monitored. Her intracranial pressure is being monitored. She's had a hemorrhagic stroke, which means that there was bleeding into the brain, and this is done ultimately for uh, brain pressures, to monitor the pressures and make sure they're kept under control. We're not going to go into too many major discussions of this kind now. We will just leave it. But if you're interested in finding out more about uh, intracranial pressure monitoring, you can go to .com, dearnurses.com, and read it at meningitis subarachnoid hemorrhage and stroke series in the clinical setting. Now we have the stroke patient, the stroke patient who's already had brain injuries. First, just take a look at Alice. Alice has got what is called expressive aphasia. Her husband is speaking to her and he's saying, Alice, do you understand me? Obviously, she's having difficulty. She's hearing what he's saying, but he's, she's having trouble understanding. So she's got brain injury to Wernicke's area in her brain. Next we have over here Martha. She has expressive aphasia. Her stroke involved what was called Broca's area. Now she's having difficulty expressing herself. She gets frustrated. She cries a lot. She has, she seems confused. Some nurses confuse this with being confused. This is not mental confusion. This is brought on by difficulty and the inability to express oneself clearly. And actually you can work along with these patients and try to just go a little bit slow when you talk to them and just try to understand. Sometimes some hospitals have charts you can use to make it easy for them to point at things if they cannot speak. Next we have what is called the wobbly walk, which is not uncommon for people who've had injuries in that part of the brain called the cerebellum. Then we have the nerve pathways crossing. So the patient who has had injury of, on the left side of the brain will ultimately have symptoms on the right. Next we go to the liver patient. Nowadays we have many, many patients who have that diagnosis, liver failure, and is looking for a liver transplant. If you'd like to know more about this topic, you can go to dearnurses.net chapter 10. This liver patient, you can learn something. He's jaundiced for one thing. He has ascites, which is the enlargement of the abdomen. He's got pedal edema, which means his feet are swollen. And he's also got something possibly called anisarca, which means that his entire body is just full of fluid. Such patients are very prone to skin breakdown, especially in the areas where pressure is applied, like where they sit down. So they'll require frequent turning. Also, another thing you can do for such patients is have specialty mattresses. Another problem is the urine. It's tea colored, so you know something is obviously wrong. Tea color is not the normal color for urine. And how about renal failure might also result. The patient in liver failure is also predisposed to renal failure. Now, the brain may also become involved. And what happens to these patients? They develop something called encephalopathy. And that's due to ammonia spilling over into the bloodstream and traveling to the brain. That means it travels from the liver to the brain. Such patients may be lethargic or they may even be in a coma. Now here's our patient who's on a heparin drip. This nurse is not even aware that something is wrong, and that's why there are lessons to be learned. When a patient has anticoagulant therapy, which is used for things like deep vein thrombosis, it may also be used for the cardiac patient who has something going on, like atrial fibrillation, and you can learn more about these topics by going to dearnurses.net and reading chapters 9 and 16. You should really be paying attention to bleeding. It could be bleeding from the gums. It could be bleeding from the IV site. It could be bleeding under the skin. There can be bleeding from the dressing. There can be bleeding in the urine. And if that should happen, you should just assess, document, and notify the doctor or your charge nurse as is appropriate for your situation. 
Now we have the transphenoidal patient, the patient who's had surgery in that part of the brain where the pituitary gland is involved. And usually it's that interruption of the pituitary gland with the antidiuretic hormone that causes them to have large quantities of urine being dumped. So it doesn't sound very exciting, but there's a lot to be learnt. These patients are going to dump large quantities of urine, clear, sometimes almost colorless urine, and it's usually fixed by giving them DDAVP, and you may just want to follow through on that on dearnurses.net, uh, the clinical settings step-by-step, -step, Chapter 5. Now, a low urinary output is a lesson to be learned. It may be caused by dehydration or kidney failure. This is the normal color of urine. Then we have cloudy urine, which is more than likely a sign of infection, or we may have blood in the urine, which may be caused by infection, may be caused by trauma, like the car accident, or the cancer patient. Next we have feces, which no, most nurses do not like talking about, but sorry to say that it's normal and I cannot think of a person who doesn't have feces. Also this is normal feces, the normal color is brown. These hard little pellets we can learn are caused by what? Constipation. The black tarry stools can be caused by bleeding but in the upper digestive tract where the digestive juices have acted on them. Then you have the stools that are lower in the digestive tract where there is not much interaction with digestive uh, juices so it's more burgundy or maroon. This is called melanin. Then we have, oops, stools white. Why would that be? The stool is white because of barium enema. This patient probably had problems going on with, the, with uh, something in the gastrointestinal tract and had to have a barium swallow, which is some sort of a dye which outlines the intestines. Then you have the green stool, which is very often brought on by the patient who's had food coloring, that blue dye uh, put into the tube feeding and turns the stools green. So there are lessons to be learned. Finally, next week we're going to discuss coma. Can patients hear you? Stay, so stay posted. Have a good week.